Seeker Summit. My name is Philippa Davies. I'm the advocacy officer for the Jamaica Coalition for a Healthy Society, and I will be the moderator for this evening's session. Welcome one and all, and we're glad to see you come back after riveting a series of apologetic summits. And we are looking forward to more coming on as the evening progresses. So the theme for this evening's session is the sanctity of life, in particular, defending the life of the unborn, or I should say advocating the life of the unborn child. And this evening is actually the first part of a training on how to advocate life for the unborn. The intention is to equip you to defend the right to life of the unborn child, whether in private discussion or in the public space. And we will be having part two in January 2022. Now, as always, we present factual truths because the truth lines up with reality and it is the best basis for a worldview to understand our world and to respond to the many challenges that we encounter. So before I give you more information on the lineup for this evening and how the format will flow, I'm going to invite Reverend Leslie Joseph Buckland Jr. to open our time with prayer. Reverend Buckland. Thank you very much, Philippa. Let us go to God in prayer. Father in heaven, we give you thanks for the Truth Seekers Summit and all that we have learned in these weeks. We give you thanks for giving us the information to defend our faith and to motivate others who have little or no faith to have faith in you. We pray a blessing upon all that will be done in this evening's Truth Seekers Summit and that we will truly be motivated to do something in defense of the unborn. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much, Reverend Buckland. And as I said, good evening to everyone. My name is Philippa Davies, Advocacy Officer of the Jamaica Coalition for a Healthy Society. We are a Christian NGO defending the biblical worldview as the best basis to organize personal life, but also society. And we are partnering with Chosen to Glow Ministries for this evening's final session for 2021 of the Truth Seekers Summit. And our theme for this evening is the sanctity of life, in particular, defending the life of the unborn child. Now, I'm going to invite Dr. Sarah Buckland to announce last week's winner of the Truth Seeker Summit number eight. And the question was, how would you convince an atheist or non-believer why you believe in the God of the Bible? Sarah, please, over to you. Thank you so much, Ms. Davies. Right. So as Ms. Davies said, we have another winner this for this question. How would you convince an atheist or non-believer why you believe in the God of the Bible? So this week's entries were so excellent. I mean, the, the entrants gave their testimonies. So we actually will be giving away three prizes this week. So we're going to feature their one minute videos now. The winners are Daniil Grant, Janiel Campbell from Jamaica Theological Seminary and Joanna Sahadeo from Trinidad. So let's hear their entries. Jesus Christ is very unique. What he requires and teaches I find very true and applicable regarding our needs, desires, and solutions. That the ultimate fulfillment comes from a relationship and worship to God rather than good works or do good. They are just merely the result of that relation. The Bible is accurate in history, prophecy, and science, but it also has changed the hearts of many. I literally felt a stirring in my belly then the word of God came alive and changed everything. I've experienced many healings and in my brokenness, he has revealed himself. And while I'm content in Christ, there is this sense that I don't belong here in this world. There is much more than this life. Wow. Next, we'll hear from Janiel Campbell and her testimony. You see, oh. you see, all right, this is Daniel Grant. The scientific makeup of our world is too precise for Earth to have been created by accident. There must be a creator. You see, 
historical sources outside the Holy Bible also proves God's existence and attest to the influence he had on our world. I don't think I can convince anyone to believe in the God of the Bible. However, I do know that I can share why I believe and let God do the rest. The main reason why I believe in the God of the Bible is because he is always with me. And I know it may sound cliche, but it is the truth. Every day when I kneel in prayer and ask God for his daily direction, I see his providential ways throughout my days. Whether it be a deadline extended or the right person shows up at the right time, every affliction I have faced, God has rescued me from all. Ask God to be in everything and you will see his hand in everything. And that's why I believe in the God of the Bible. Very powerful. I'm going to have to um, put up this video from Janil because unfortunately, oh, okay, I believe that it's actually up. So bear with us, please. Just a few moments. This is Janil Campbell's entry. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Janil Campbell, and today my question is, how would I convince an atheist or a non-believer um, why I believe in the God of the Bible? No, I can mention a lot of things, the, the disasters and the earthquakes and everything that is happening around us that were prophesied in Matthew 24. But today I'm going to use my personal testimony because the Bible said we're overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimonies. No, um, when I started the Jamaica Theological Seminary last year, I did not have any money and I depended on God to provide for me and he keeps providing for me. He provided scholarships and um, grants and my school fees covered up until now, right? Because he said in his word that he, he provide for his people. You know, he said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and he will give us all things, right? So I depended on God. You know, I had faith in God that he would come through for me and that is a word I live by. I live and I testify by the word of God and I see it every day manifested in my life because I choose to obey it. And because of that, that um, I, because of my testimony, I believe in the God of the Bible. I believe what the Bible says. I believe in the word of God because I have proven it in my life. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so Chosen to Glow Ministries would again like to extend a hearty congratulations to our three winners this week. And um, you will receive your prizes. So over this, these weeks, our sponsors have actually been giving away books and DVDs worth hundreds of US dollars to our winners. And especially, more importantly, very faith-building resources. So all of you are one step closer to being eligible for grand prizes of other gift certificates, Ten of Black Christian Book, Recharged Lifestyle, and a museum tour. So back to you, Miss Davies. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. And to let, um, I think you said that the award ceremony for the grand prizes would be next week, Thursday, November 25, between six and seven. Yes, correct. Okay. Uh, let me, yes. So, um, should I should I announce this week's question now or wait until later on? Well, I suppose we could just go ahead and announce the week's question now. All uh, right. So take note, participants. This question week. This week's question is: Tell us in one minute or less. Is the decision to keep or terminate a pregnancy a woman's right? Is the decision to keep or to terminate a pregnancy a woman's right and you know the the process to record and upload your video to facebook or to email christ.the.way one way christ.the.one way at gmail.com and to tag at chosen to glow ministries and add the hashtag youth for truth caption the video with your name organization if applicable the question that you're answering and the entries are open from today, Thursday, November 18th, and will close next week, Tuesday, midday, Jamaica time. So the question again for this week, is the decision to keep or terminate a pregnancy 
a woman's right. Thank you very much, Sarah. Yes. So participants, Particip those who have joined us since we began, welcome again to this final edition for 2021 of the Truth Seekers Summit. And our theme this evening is the sanctity of life, in particular, defending the life of the unborn. So the format for this evening is that we're going to present briefly the facts, the facts on pregnancy and the stages of pregnancy, the facts of abortion. And then we're going to have a short panel answering questions and arguments that have been commonly used in the debate about abortion and about preserving the life of the unborn. And then we're going to break out into three thematic breakout rooms. You'll be able to choose which one. And the options are social media, school, and equipping the church. What are we going to look at? We're going to have overseas presenters who are seasoned veterans in those three areas share their best practices, their tips of how they built out a campaign promoting life of the unborn, the value of the life of the unborn using social media or establishing clubs in school and equipping the church. And we're going to invite you to choose one of those three areas so that you can learn more of how to build out such a campaign. And I'm gonna ask you to consider how can you join this so important movement of defending the life of the unborn through one of those three areas. So let's get started with the facts about pregnancy. And our first presenter is Dr. Brittany Clacken. She is a medical doctor, a native of the Bahamas, and the volunteer team leader of the Love March Movement. The Love March Movement is a Jamaican Christian youth NGO dedicated to the family and sexual purity. And she's going to take us through the facts about pregnancy and the stages of pregnancy. Dr. Clacken, over to you. Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. I'm just going to uh, share my screen and show a brief video, and then we can go through some of the main points of the video when it's done. This is Olivia. Though she has yet to greet the outside world, she has already completed an amazing journey. This is the moment that life begins. A new human being has come into existence. At fertilization, her gender, ethnicity, hair color, eye color, and countless traits are already determined. She begins to implant in the uterus about one week after fertilization. Her cells organize into what we call an embryo. At three weeks in one day, just 22 days after fertilization, Olivia's heartbeat can be detected. The buds of her arms and legs appear by four weeks. She begins to move between five and six weeks with both spontaneous and reflexive movements. At six weeks from fertilization, her brain activity can be recorded and bone formation begins. She can bring her hands together at seven and a half weeks and separate fingers and toes emerge. She can also begin to hiccup. At the beginning of the ninth week, Olivia will have grown from a single cell into nearly one billion cells, and she is now called the fetus. She will suck her thumb and swallow, grasp an object, touch her face, sigh and stretch. At 11 weeks, she is playing in the womb, moving her body and exploring her environment. Her taste bud cells have matured by week 12, but are still scattered throughout her mouth. Her mother will first sense Olivia's movements between 14 and 18 weeks, an event called quickening. Beginning at 18 weeks, ultrasounds show speaking movements in her voice box. 
around 20 weeks with a lot of help, babies have survived outside the womb. At 27 weeks, her eyes are responding to light. She can recognize her parents' voices and will even recognize lullabies and stories. Olivia has gone on an amazing journey during these last nine months. She will soon signal to her mother that it is time for delivery and greet the outside world. Okay, so... Uh oh, sorry. Accidental. Right, so that was the video. And basically, a few things I want to point out here. One is that um, life begins at conception, right? That's the first um, and most important point that I want to highlight. Life begins at conception, which we saw when the sperm met with the egg, that's when human development begins a brand new, um, a brand new organism is formed, a brand new life is formed. Um, most abortion advocates would say that it's not a baby, it's just a clump of cells. So when you saw the first part of the story of Olivia, when when it was just a big ball tumbling through, that is the clump of cell stage. And at this stage, the woman has no idea that she's pregnant. This is just one or two weeks from fertil um, one or two weeks from fertilization. Fertilization occurs during ovulation. So ovulation, usually a woman has a period that's seven days, another week goes by, then she will ovulate, she'll produce an egg. And that's the time that she can get pregnant. Two weeks after that, um, she, she may be expecting her next period, depending on, on her cycle, right? So at the time that the baby is a ball, a cluster of cells, as they would like to say, she's not expecting a period at all, right? Now, remember that the, the embryo, the fetus, the baby that's growing inside the womb of, of the woman, of a human woman can only be a human. It is not a zombie. It is not a dog. It is not an elephant. It is not a reptile. Two humans can only produce a human child. So that's what we're talking about, right? Um, and um, some of you or most of you would have heard about the controversial heartbeat bill that was just passed in Texas because they use the presence of a heartbeat to indicate the presence of life. And as we saw in the video, a heartbeat can be detected as early as three weeks from conception. If you time it from the last menstrual period, it would be around four weeks, right? If you time it from conception, it would be three weeks. At this stage, excuse me, at this stage, the woman is not aware that she's pregnant. She may not have missed her period as yet. She's probably thinking it's going to start in a few days. She's not concerned at all. Before she even knows she's pregnant, the baby already has a heartbeat, which is a signal of, of life. And it, it also has health implications in terms of, for example, an ectopic pregnancy, which can be dealt with either surgically or medically. But if there's a strong heartbeat, it has to be dealt with um, surgically because it, it, it has other health implications. So that's one of the things that you learn in medical school. And as you complete studies in obstetrics and gynecology, you will realize that the way a pregnant woman is treated um, is much different depending on the presence or absence of a heartbeat. That, that baby, that unborn child in her womb is treated differently based on the presence or absence of a heartbeat because a heartbeat indicates life, right? Um, so that would occur, as I said, 18 to 22 days after fertilization of about three weeks. And um, if you are interested in learning about embryology or you want to fact check me, you can check the Developing Human. It's an embryology textbook that has been revised several times. But basically, any embryology textbook will tell you that human life begins at conception. 
And also you can check Carl Sagan's American Heritage Dictionary for other um, definitions. So that's basically it about the stages of a human. Obviously, if it's a male fetus, if it's a boy, um, things would be slightly different. The, the general overview is the same, but obviously the child would have male gametes and male gonads, male uh, penis and, and so forth. But the, the general gist is basically the same. So that's it. Okay, thanks so much very much, Dr. Clacken. And indeed, if you somebody wanted to fact check you, well, the facts, you've checked the facts and you've presented the facts and they can check a biology book to ensure that what you're saying is presenting the reality, the factual truth. Interesting to note that time for measuring the age of the pregnancy begins at conception. Is that so, Dr. Clacken? So when we hear people talking about 12 weeks or 10 weeks, when did time begin to run for them to assess a measurement of 10 weeks, 12 weeks, 22 weeks? All right, so most... Most people will time the pregnancy or the gestation based on the last menstrual period of the woman. However, that is only accurate if the woman has a regular cycle, right? Um, so they would use an early ultrasound to date and they would use the size of the baby, but generally you use the, the last menstrual period. In that video, they, they did not use the last menstrual period. And that's why I let it play until the end because it shows you their disclaimer. They started their timing from fertilization, which is usually two weeks after um, the, the menstrual period. But when you hear someone say 20 weeks, 12 weeks, they've timed it from, from the woman's menstrual period. Um, so four weeks of a four week pregnancy would be um, a four week pregnancy. The woman wouldn't even know really that she's um, pregnant as yet. Um, so earliest the woman would find out would be around six weeks from her last period, which would be when she would be um, due her next period. So the timing starts from her last menstrual period, which is usually two weeks before fertilization occurs. Right. But factored in that is the fact that fertilization has occurred, conception has occurred, the fusing Correct. of sperm and egg and a new human being. Correct, right. correct. Thanks so much, Dr. Clacken. No We're problem. going to move on now to the facts about abortion. And I'm going to invite Sarah to play the video, the short video associated with that. And then we're going to go into a brief discussion about abortion. My name is Dr. Anthony Levitino. I'm a practicing obstetrician gynecologist and I've performed over 1,200 abortions. Today I'm going to describe a second trimester surgical abortion called dilatation and evacuation, or D&E. A D&E is performed between 13 and 24 weeks of pregnancy. After administering anesthesia, the abortionist uses a weighted speculum, like this one, that opens the vagina widely. Because second trimester babies are so large, this greater access facilitates a late-term abortion. Late-term abortion requires that the cervix be prepared 24 to 48 hours in advance with laminaria. Laminaria is a type of sterilized seaweed that absorbs water over 8 to 12 hours and swells to several times its original diameter. Once removed, metal dilators can be used to further open the cervix as needed. Once the cervix has been stretched open, the suction tube is placed inside. A baby at 20 weeks gestation is as big as the length of my hand from head to rump, not counting the legs. The suction machine is turned on and pale yellow amniotic fluid surrounding the baby is suctioned out through the catheters. But babies this big, they don't fit through catheters this size. The baby's bones and skull are too strong to be torn apart by suction alone. This is a sofa clamp. A sofa clamp is made of stainless steel. It's about 13 inches long. The business end is about two and a half inches long and a half inch wide, and there are rows of sharp teeth. This is a grasping instrument. When it gets a hold of something, it does not let go. The abortionist uses this clamp to grasp an arm or leg. Once he has a firm grip, the abortionist pulls hard in order to tear the limb from the baby's body. One by one, the rest of the limbs are removed, along with the intestines, the spine, and the heart and lungs. 
Usually the most difficult part of the procedure is extracting the baby's head, which is about the size of a large plum at 20 weeks. The head is grasped and crushed. The abortionist knows he has crushed the skull when a white substance comes out of the cervix. This was the baby's brains. The abortionist then removes skull pieces. He removes the placenta and any leftover parts of the baby with a curette, scraping the lining of the uterus for any remaining tissue. The abortionist then collects the baby parts and reassembles them to make sure that there are two arms, two legs, and all the pieces. Once all the parts have been accounted for, the abortion is complete. For the woman, this procedure carries a Thank you so much. Um, sorry that I, sorry, I'll, I'll let Philippa introduce me just one second. Uh, my apologies, participants, for that interrupted video. Um, we will resume, but let me just introduce the facilitator for this topic, Dr. Callum Miller, who works as a medical doctor in the UK. So he's on a different time zone. It's very, very early in the morning almost, um, but we're grateful that he could be with us. He's an international speaker and has published in top academic venues and uh, on the matter of bioethics and including on the BBC and at the White House. So we're grateful that Dr. Miller could join us on this topic of abortion. Dr. Miller, over to you and then back to the video. Thank you so much, Philippa. Well, I won't take up much of your time. We've got a lot to get through, um, but I just wanted to take a few minutes really to outline uh, the process of abortion. Now, you've been shown a video just now, which is distressing to watch, and I'm sorry um, for anyone who has been distressed by that. Um, we think it's important to show the reality of this because justice is important and reality is important. And as distressing as reality can be, this is what a second trimester surgical abortion involves. There are about 9,000 of these every year in the UK, um, far, far more in the US because surgical abortion is much more common in the United States. So I'll just very quickly outline the abortion procedures. And I'm sorry um, you're being introduced to me in this way by talking about such a um, challenging and, and distressing subject, but we want to give you the basic facts before we do a little bit of Q&A. So I'll just share my slides. So um, there are two main kinds of abortion, medical, which means abortion by taking pills and delivering the baby as in a miscarriage, and surgical abortion where instruments are used to remove the baby from the womb. Um, some countries mostly do medical abortions like the UK and many parts of Europe. Other countries mostly do surgical abortions like the United States of America. Um, medical abortions throughout the pregnancy can be done at any time in the pregnancy and they usually involve the same procedure taking one or two kinds of pill which removes the baby from the lining of the uterus and therefore deprives it of oxygen and nutrients and so on and so depriving it of oxygen in the way that we might be deprived of oxygen that would obviously end our life um, Medical abortions work in that way. And then another pill used to contract the womb so that a miscarriage is induced. Um, in very late abortions, after about 21 weeks, because the baby is viable and potentially could survive outside of the womb, a procedure called feticide has to be performed first, which involves injecting potassium chloride into the baby's heart to end the heartbeat before the baby is um, miscarried. Um, so those are how medical abortions happen. Surgical abortions can be one of two types. The first is vacuum aspiration or curatage. Um, this involves either vacuuming the baby um, so that it's destroyed in the process and it comes out of the womb that way, or curatage involves kind of scraping parts of the baby because it's so small that the baby is scraped out of the womb gradually. Those are done for early surgical abortions and most abortions are done in the first trimester. When you get into the second trimester, you have a DNE, a dilation and evacuation, which is the process that you saw on the screens just a moment ago. Now that is obviously a minority of abortions, but it demonstrates the radicalness of the abortion industry, the fact that 9,000 of those DE abortions 
are performed every year in the UK and many, many more thousands around the world shows that this isn't just a mind, you know, a small rare event. This is something that is a significant part of the way abortions are carried out. But of course, all of them do involve ending the life of the child. Um, so this is just a description. Um, the NHS website, our National Health Service in the UK says in very euphemistic terms, this is the process you've just seen on the video. It involves special instruments called forceps through the cervix and into the womb to remove the pregnancy. And it sounds very benign. As you've seen in the video, of course, though, um, it, the truth is much more um, significant than that. The truth is much more um, radical and many would say barbaric the way that these abortions are carried out. It is worth being aware that babies can probably feel pain as early as 12 weeks of pregnancy. So these babies will be conscious and will be able to feel pain. Um, there's one particularly radical kind of abortion which was performed fairly often in the US until it was banned uh, about a decade or two ago. Um, it's, it was still the minority of abortions. I'm not saying these were what most abortions are like, but there was a significant number of these abortions every year. It's called partial birth abortion. Um, now, the author of this procedure says classic DE that you saw in the video is accomplished by dismembering the fetus with instruments and removing the pieces. However, most surgeons find dismemberment at 20 weeks and beyond to be difficult because the fetal tissue is too tough. Um, and so there's an alternative method, which is called intact dilation and extraction, or also known as partial birth abortion. And he describes it here. DNX can be described as dilation of the cervix to open the cervix up, use ultrasound to watch what you're doing, uh, tilt the fetus or the baby to get it in the right position, you deliver half of the baby so that only the head remains inside um, of the mother and then crush the skull as most of the baby has been delivered. Um, and there's, there's much more to say about that. And it was done on healthy women with healthy babies. This wasn't something that was only done in extreme situations. So one of the practitioners of this said, in the vast majority of cases, the procedure is performed on a healthy mother with a healthy fetus that is over 20 weeks throughout the pregnancy. So clearly completely developed and fully formed. Um, again, I don't talk about this to kind of turn this into a Halloween or a kind of scaremongering talk, um, but it is important that we know the reality of abortion so that we know exactly what it involves. Um, so Obviously, the video that we showed before was a cartoon version. I'm not going to show a real abortion, um, please be assured. But I do want to show you that the cartoon of the baby wasn't just exaggerating the humanity of the baby. So this is a video of a real embryo or fetus in the womb at just eight weeks. This is very, very early in the pregnancy, just eight weeks after conception. And this is real footage of a baby in the womb. Sorry, can you hear that or do I need to reshare with sound? Let me just do that. Okay, you should be able to hear now. Sorry, one moment. The embryo is becoming more physically active during this time. Motions may be slow or rapid, single or repetitive, spontaneous or reflexive head rotation, neck extension, and hand-to-face contact occur more often. Touching the embryo elicits squinting, jaw movement, grasping motions, and toe pointing. Between seven and eight weeks, the upper and lower eyelids rapidly grow over the eyes and partially fuse together. Although there is no air in the uterus, the embryo displays intermittent breathing motions by eight weeks. Okay, so very quickly then just at the end, there are obviously a number of complications associated with this. In the short term, it can cause hemorrhaging, infection, uh, perforation of the uterus, and so on. Um, in the long term, we know that abortion is linked with higher rates of preterm birth and mental health difficulties, particularly suicide. And so this is a serious procedure which has significant um, consequences for the woman, who of course is equally valuable to the child and is deserving of our utmost 
respect and care. Um, so I'm sorry this has been such a whirlwind tour of this topic. Um, the time is short um, and I'm very grateful for your patience in me getting to you. Um, but I hope that's a helpful introduction at least to the reality of abortion. And we can now go on to a time of uh, answering some key questions that come up very frequently in this area. So thank you for your patience. And thank you very much, Dr. Miller, for participating and sharing with us. And participants, just to remind you that this is the first part of a training. We will meet again in January 2022, and the videos will be available for you to review as, as you like and to share with others. So we know the time will be short this evening. But we're now going to have a panel of, of experts to handle some of the common arguments and questions that are raised in the debate about the life of the unborn and abortion. You can post your questions in the chat. We may not get to all of them and some of them might be covered in some of the common arguments and questions that we will have, but let's get to our discussion. So I'm going to invite our other two panelists. We have Mrs. Stephanie Christian, who is a licensed associate professional counselor. And one of our areas of specialization is to provide counseling services to post-abortive women. She has over 13 years of experience in this ministry and has conducted healing retreats for post-abortive women and victims of abuse. And she is based in Jamaica with the Roman Catholic Archdiocese in Kingston. We're also joined by Ms. Francesca Tavares, who is a Jamaican attorney at law, who is also presently pursuing postgraduate studies in compliance at the University of Freeburg. And she's the vice president of the Love March Movement, the youth Christian organization for sexual purity and the family in Jamaica. So let me invite Francesca, Mrs. Christian and Callum, please put on your videos. And I'm going to field some of these questions that I say are commonly raised in the debate on abortion and preserving the life of the unborn. So let's take this first question about keeping a pregnancy if it's a woman's right. Zachary, I'm gonna ask you to post the question into the chat, if you don't mind, thanks so much. So let's take this question about rights. We hear a lot, it's my rights, it's my body, it's my choice. Is keeping a pregnancy a woman's right? And also, do, have, do men have anything to say about abortion? Should it only be women? Francesco, what do you say on this to that kind of question? Uh, thanks so much for having me and for asking that question, Philippa. First of all, you know, abortion is a human rights issue, not just a woman's issue. Therefore, the voice of men as human beings is welcome and needed, and it should be heard on the subject. And in fact, uh, something that, that I've said before, abortion isn't a reproductive right or 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 any right at all, it's it's a human wrong. It's an act of violence against the most vulnerable persons in our society, the pre-born child. Abortion not only destroys human life, but it carries risks, which Dr. Um, Callum Miller listed, risks, physical and psychological, which have lasting, devastating impacts for the mother and certainly for her pre-born baby. You know, according to abortion activists, the fact that women, like all people, have bodily autonomy, um, it means that the right to the life of her child is a violation of the mother's rights. And I'm going into the bodily argument a bit right here, but it's kind of linked. The, the, the argument is that the, the, um, the, 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 the pre-born child is in the mother's womb. The father does not have that, carry that, that responsibility, so he should have no say. Um, but the bodily autonomy argument in this instance, it does not carry water. It doesn't justify abortion because um, men should have an opinion about abortion and the law should recognize a father's right to defend his preborn child. And while mothers take on the risk of carrying children and fathers do not, um, this is just a biological fact. It's not an act of patriarchy. As one of the biological parents of the baby, father shared responsibility for carrying the child into the world and ensuring that the child is cared for. And we hold them accountable to this after the child is born. Along with that responsibility, that duty, comes the, the, the right to advocate for the life of that child. And we've heard in Jamaica, at least, of many instances or a few instances where the, the father has no recourse 
where the mother unilaterally decides to end the life of the child. Father's in tears saying, please don't. I will take care of the, the, the baby. You can dissolve all your rights. I'll take care of the baby. The mother does it unilaterally. What then? What then? Negating a father's right to defend his preborn child sends a message. Fathers are not necessary. They undermine, and it undermines the, the essential role of fathers in society. Babies also have fathers. And as other um, pro-life advocates have said so beautifully, Having a uterus isn't a precondition to having an opinion on abortion. Fatherhood is necessary and important. That's that. Thanks so much, Francesca. But let me ask this question. What if a woman or a girl becomes pregnant because of the horrific crime of rape or of incest? Shouldn't she have the right to abort that child rather than to carry that the memory of that horrific trauma for the rest of her life? Mrs. Christian. What would you say in that kind of circumstance or have said to persons that you have encountered? Should we have abortion for rape or incest, pregnancy due to rape or incest? You could unmute, please. Thanks. Uh, Mrs. Christian, um, we're not hearing you. You're a bit faint. Are you hearing me? Ah, that's better. Thank you. Okay. Um, I was having some trouble with my earphones, so oh, okay. I had to get rid of it. Okay, so the question about rape, rape and, and incest. Um, I must say that it, it is a hard case, and I would not for one moment be insensitive to the pain and, and, and sorrow that a woman would have after experiencing that violence being done you know, to her and then finding out that she's carrying life. Um, but the fact remains, whether a child has been conceived in the case of rape and incest, or you know, it, was, it was a willing pregnancy, it's still life. All that we have seen in the, the, the two videos we watched. Um, that doesn't change because the child was conceived in, in, the, in the case of rape and incest. And a woman who finds herself in that situation really needs much support, much support. Uh, she needs to be given options and there are options um, so that if she does not want to actually raise that child, she you know, can know, well, maybe there is someone who is willing to adopt this child or just to explore and ensure that for the nine months of that pregnancy, there is someone there or, or a group of persons there to walk her through. And I can tell you that I've done that for, you know, at least a couple of, of, of um, young, young women who have been raped and they have been given the option of adopting, um, giving up the baby for adoption and they have chosen not to. They have chosen to carry the baby and to take care of that child as if it was a willing pregnancy. Um, and there are so many cases that we know about where women have raised their child, carry their pregnancy, raised their child, and this child was has been the light of their life, and, and some they, they never conceived again. So, you know, I, I want to stress the point that it is important for that woman to be cared for in, in a very special way but it is still, there is no reason, no matter the circumstances that makes abortion okay. So Mrs. Christian, in your counseling though, have you found women who regretted then having the abortion or wish that despite the rape, despite the incest, they had kept their baby? Um, let's, let's say, I, I have not actually spoken to a woman who has um, had an abortion because of, of rape. 
um, most of the abortions that, that you know, I have dealt with, women got pregnant willingly, okay? Um, but whether, whether they had an abortion from rape or they had an abortion um, from a, a, a regular pregnancy, um, there is definitely regret. Um, I, I will just read a quote um, from, from one woman and it says, my abortion has left me empty, alone and in despair. The self-hatred I see every time I look in the mirror has been my constant companion for the last 10 years. And that's coming straight from the woman. So yes, there, there is definitely regret. Um, there are some other challenges, some other um, emotional problems with, with abortion. Um, there is increased anxiety, uh, there is, you know, self-harm, the, the, the chances of, of um, suicide, there's flashbacks, um, there is just a, a plethora of emotional um, problems as a result of, of an abortion. And, you know, I, I can remember speaking with, with one, one woman and after we had been talking, she kept on telling me for about a year that she did the right thing, having had um, an abortion. But she kept on coming because she was not doing well. And finally, after about a year and a half, she, I, she actually said, I miss my baby and I regret having had that abortion, even though she kept on saying for such a long time, it was the right thing to do. And I wanted to say to her, if it, is, it was the right thing to do, why are you here? But I was patient. I just listened. Um, so the fact that women are made to feel like this is the right choice. Once you make the decision, it's everything is okay. You'll forget about it. You'll carry on with your life. It's not that. Um, what happens is that the very reason that a woman gives for having this abortion, it's going to interfere with my education. Um, it will cause my relationship to break. All kinds of reasons. I can't afford it. All of those things play out after the abortion. Mm -hmm. They drop out of school, they fall into financial difficulties, the relationship ends anyway. So the abortion did not achieve the objective. All that it was supposed to have accomplished, it has not. So just to go back to your question about the rape and incest, I would say that all of the women who I have spoken with, um, who have been raped, have, have kept their baby. They have kept their baby. Um, I, I know that there are persons too who may have aborted after rape. They don't necessarily tell you that. They will say they have had an abortion. They won't necessarily tell you the circumstances sometimes. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mrs. Christian. That is a poignant point that the reasons given by the mothers to justify the abortion were not satisfied in reality after the abortion. That's very, very poignant. Let me turn to Dr. Miller. Perhaps you could share from the UK if you are aware of any statistics as to the percentage of abortions that are due to pregnancy from rape or from incest. And I'd also like you to talk about what if we hear the argument, the mother's life is at risk. She's at risk and therefore abortion must be undertaken. So if you could comment on those two, please. Sure, well, this will really be the tip of the iceberg. All of these topics, it's possible to give an hour lecture on and more on, on each of them. So please don't feel, if you feel like we haven't said enough, then please do be patient and come back in future and we'll, we'll tackle this in more detail. Um, in terms of pregnancies or uh, abortions due to sexual crime, um, 
we know from the US that it's far less than 1%. Uh, 1% seems to be the maximum statistic given in the US for abortions done as a result of rape. Um, in other countries, it seems to be even less. Um, most studies, it's a very, very tiny, tiny proportion. Like I say, 1% is the maximum, really. Another example is Poland which keeps statistics and which allows abortion if the child is disabled or if the woman has been uh, the victim of sexual assault. And what they find is that even though abortion for disability is a tiny proportion of abortions in general, it's only about 2% in the UK, the number of abortions for rape in Poland is a tiny, tiny proportion compared to the number of abortions due to disability. So that means it's an even smaller percentage. So it's difficult to get exact statistics, but we know that this is a tiny proportion of abortions. But we know, of course, that those women matter and they shouldn't be dismissed just because they are a small minority. They are still infinitely valuable and deserve to have their pain addressed and to have um, the support that they need, um, no matter how few of them there are. They, they really deserve that. Um, in terms of the question of if a woman's life is at risk, well, again, fortunately, this is a very tiny proportion. And in the UK, we have good statistics on this. So out of 200,000 abortions each year in the UK, we know in the official statistics, which are very accurate, that only 100 at most out of 200,000 are to save the life of the mother, only 100 at most. When you look into those situations, you find that many of those don't actually require an abortion. Some of them, the baby is already viable beyond 21 weeks and could be delivered without ending its life. In other cases, there have been things like high cholesterol. Now, many people have high cholesterol, and it's not a reason that you need an abortion to save your life. I have high cholesterol, and it's not, a, it's not in that sense such an urgent and significant health condition that you need an abortion um, urgently. Um, and so when I say 100, that really is the maximum estimate. And when you look at the figures in detail, the number of abortions really needed to save a life are far, far fewer still. Um, now, in most of these cases, if you don't save the mother's life, the baby sadly will also pass away. So in almost all of these cases, you can only save the mother. There is no way to save the baby. The baby will sadly pass away regardless of what you do. And so what you can do is deliver the baby if it's causing an infection, for example, to save the life of the mother. And you don't intend to end the life of the baby, but you foresee that the baby will pass away as a result of being delivered early. And so you never need to intentionally and directly end the life of the baby in any medical situation. But what you can do in these very, very rare situations is deliver the child early to save the life of the mother, knowing that even if you hadn't delivered the child, the mother and the baby both would have passed away. And so it's, it's really making the most of a, of, a, of a terrible, tragic situation where you can only save one life and that's better than saving neither life. So I hope that's a, a helpful introduction to that question. Right, and ectopic pregnancies, Callum, how do you respond to those? Yeah, so that, that's, that's a fair question. So those are much more numerous. So ectopic pregnancies are more like one to 2% of all um, pregnancies. Um, very rarely there have been cases of ectopic pregnancies where the baby has survived, um, but usually that's not possible. And usually that uh, ectopic pregnancies would be treated under the same principles. If you leave the baby there, it will pose a risk to the life of the mother long before viability, and when the mother passes away, the baby will also pass away. So yes, in, in most cases of ectopic pregnancies, you do need to remove the child, but you don't need to directly and intentionally end its life. Um, but th that would be a more common situation where it, it, would, it would usually be ethical to remove the child, um, foreseeing, again, sadly, that it will pass away, but in order to save the life of the mother. Okay, thank you, Dr. Miller. Let me turn to Francesca and Mrs. Christian again, some cultural and social realities for us in Jamaica. And we hear these arguments often about poverty. The mother is poor, can't afford to have any more children. Or child abuse. Wouldn't abortion reduce child abuse? Isn't it more humane for her to abort the child than to live in poverty or to abuse the child? Francesco, what say you? Mrs. Christian, what say you? Francesco? 
And the question of, is it more humane to abort the child and the child live in poverty? Poverty, yeah. Suffering? It's an easy answer. No, no, that's false compassion. It's false compassion. It's saying, I don't want you to maybe suffer, so I'll just kill you. It makes no sense. Um, what is poverty anyway? It's, that's that's relative and differs from country to country and it's heavily dependent on the standard of living in that particular um, locality. You know, poverty in Iceland looks different from poverty in Mozambique. But just to say, the human experience is inherently difficult. It's filled with challenges and hardship and beauty. There's no guarantee that a child born in wealth won't subsequently become poor and experience physical hardships. Each human being has the opportunity with the lives that they have to surmount challenges and determine their own destinies. And, you know, we celebrate persons who are able to overcome poverty and overcome um, various personal difficulties to achieve their goals. And you don't say to them, oh, you poor thing, you should have died so that you wouldn't have to have experienced that. We're so sorry. Um, the value of a human being is not determined by their socioeconomic status or perceived happiness. The right to life is not reserved for the plan, the privilege, or the perfect. It's a right. Um, and innocent children shouldn't receive a death penalty because of perceived, predicted suffering in quotations. And we just want to say that this is something that we say often um, amongst abortion advocates. And the, the abortion, and it exposes the underbelly of the abortion agenda generally. It, the abortion agenda does not seek to actually remove poverty. It seeks to remove the poor. It's not advocating um, to address the system that actually oppress human beings, it's not advocating for fair wages, access to home ownership. It seeks to kill the poor. It's an insidious and wicked agenda and it's one that we should see for what it is in Jamaica and resist. Um, all the right to life is inherent, okay? And poverty is not a crime. Yes. Thank you, Francesca. Mrs. Christian, how you respond, especially about child abuse. You'd have to unmute. Yes, thanks. Um, oh. I'm, I'm not muted. Okay. Are you are you hearing me? I'm hearing you now. Thanks. Okay. Um, just just to share a, a case I had not, not so long ago. Um, a woman who was raped decided to, to keep the baby. Um, so she, she didn't have the abortion, but um, after the baby was born, she changed her mind and said she didn't, she didn't want to, to keep the baby. She wanted to give the baby up. Um, now, you know that the whole process of adoption in, in Jamaica, the formal adoption process is long and, and, and you know, it, it, I don't know why it is so difficult and time consuming, but it is. But there was this lady who I would say we would probably describe her as poor, okay? Yes, she, she has a home, and, 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 but she's not working. And she heard about the, the, the case of that baby and decided that she would take the baby. She would take that child and she would, you know, take a, try to, to, to get help from wherever she could help, because she said, this is a life. I have taken many babies and God has helped me to keep them until someone who is in a better position can take them and raise them. And she has that child, you know? So as you, as, as doctor said, um, pover crime is not a poverty. I mean, poverty is not a crime. And being poor is no reason to have an abortion. On, on the matter of abuse, you know, people say that if you, if you keep it, the baby and you're poor and all of the negative circumstances, um, you know, what's going to happen is that you will abuse the child. Well, research has shown that a woman who has an abortion is more likely to maltreat her child you know um she has difficulty bonding with that child um just the the regular needs that a child has a woman finds it difficult to be able to meet those needs and 
if you think about a woman who has had an abortion, uh, being depressed and anxious, and there's all kinds of tension and emotional um, challenges that she's having, she is not in a very good place to be able to care for her child. So abuse is more likely after an abortion rather than, you know, um, having the child um, and, you know, not, 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 not having the, the, the abortion. Yeah. And could I just add quickly sure. you know, that our legacy um, as a society that um, has in our history um, slavery, we have the legacy of, of women who, who saw the situation that their children would have been born into, but said, no, life was worth it. Life was worth it because there is the possibility of hope and deliverance and they, 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 they so valued the life within their womb and so so believed in, in the possibility of freedom that we are here today. Even our, our, our national hero, George William Gordon, he was the son of, uh, of, of, a, of a white man and a, and a black woman. And we don't know the circumstances of his birth. We don't know the power play that would have existed um, at that time, but he was born. And what did he do? His life resulted in the freedom of a generation of persons. So you see, um, the legacy that we have as formerly enslaved persons is stubborn hope and resilience. You look at the circumstances and you say, you know what? Better must come and better must come for my child, even if what I see right now is not ideal. So no, the legacy of Jamaica, the legacy of the, of, of the, of the Black Caribbean is one of life, one that fights for life. Thanks, Francesca. Stubborn hope and resilience. And what I appreciate from our panelists in your response is that we find in the abortion debate that there's often an emotional response to the hard scenario that is painted. But what we need to do is to think through and respond with reason and with compassion and with truth, because we are offering a response that preserves life to that hard scenario. So I appreciate that so much, panelists. Let me just take one last one before we move on. Uh, Dr. Miller. What if a child is disabled? And what about the argument that we hear that keeping abortion illegal will force women to go into the backstreet alleys and do dangerous abortions at home? It's now it's legal in the UK. What have you found with that argument about the backstreet alley? And what about if the child is disabled? Yeah, those are two two very big questions. Um, so I'll I'll go one by one. So on the question of disability, there's obviously a huge amount that could be said. Um, most of us will know people with disabilities, and we will mostly think I, I I think that they have lives that are worth living. They enjoy living. Um, their lives are valuable, and they are precious, and they are loved by their families and their friends. Um, this is the case even when that disability is very, very complex and, and significant. Um, and, and that should, I think, be the starting point. So when people say that having an abortion is better for disabled children because it's better for the child, I think all we need to do is look at the people with disabilities that we know. And maybe we have disabilities. I do. Um, and we have to think, would these people be better off dead? would the world be a better place without them? And I think when we put a face to that claim, we realize that it's not as compassionate as it sounds. We're saying the world would be a better place without you, th this person that I know in my life. And that that is something that I think most of us would reject. Um, in the UK, it's legal to have an abortion for disability at any point until birth, even if it's a disability like Down syndrome or cleft palate or cleft lip. And the latter two are correctable through surgery you can still have an abortion at any point until the moment of birth and even during birth in the UK if the child has a disability and there's something wrong with that culture I think where we allow such barbaric late-term abortions to be performed on a subset of people that are already marginalized and vulnerable in our society now, there are going to be cases where the child has a really significant disability such that they will pass away shortly after birth. And what, again, there's so much that could be said here, but the, the two things I'll say are this. Firstly, we often don't know in, uh, in advance how long the baby will live. Um, 
there's a condition called anencephaly where the brain doesn't develop. And this is something that is called a life limiting condition or a fatal anomaly, meaning that the child will likely die during pregnancy or shortly after birth. But actually, the published record for a child surviving with this condition is two years. And when I presented this to a, a group of pediatricians recently, one of them said to me, I have a patient with anencephaly who is six years old, and these stories are not heard. They're not even in the literature. And so we often have a false sense of how long these children survive and how much they enjoy their lives. Um, it, and I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying, you know, children with disabilities have normal lives and that it's easy to look after them. Sometimes it can be really, really difficult. But when you look at what parents say, and there's a lot of academic literature, listening to parents' stories, what they overwhelmingly say is that if they have an abortion because the child is disabled, it is the hardest thing in their life. And they often describe it explicitly as torture. They say it was torture to go through an abortion because my child had a disability. Because in most of these cases, the pregnancy will have been wanted and intended. By contrast, when you look at parents who have made the difficult decision, granted, to continue the pregnancy, they overwhelmingly say, we're glad we did it. There's one study that shows 98% of parents who went through a disability, um, who went through a pregnancy where the child had a fatal disability, still 98% of parents said they had no regrets at all. Um, and so if you're really in doubt about this, I would encourage you to look at some of the literature and also watch a video called 99 Balloons, 99 Balloons. It's a story of a couple who had a child with Edwards syndrome, which is also considered a life limiting condition uh, or a fatal anomaly. They can show, and that video shows really powerfully how even in these really difficult situations, that life is worth living. And so um, I would encourage you to watch that. Um, now, finally, just to come very quickly to the question of backstreet abortions, will abortions happen anyway? Um, the short answer is yes, but not to the same levels. So any crime, when you make it illegal, will still occur, but it will be much rarer. And that's the truth. That's the case for murder, for assault, for sexual assault, for theft. All of these things still occur, but we don't say we should make them legal because they occur anyway. We say, well, the law probably reduces them and makes it a rarer problem than it would otherwise be. And there's overwhelming empirical literature proving that. We know from study after study, literally dozens of studies show that protections for the unborn child in law do protect women from having abortions and the abortion rate is lower. Now, there's this other question of whether women's lives will be put at risk. Um, there's a huge amount that could be said on this, but the short answer is that when you look at the statistics on this, countries which have good health care and pro-life laws have no deaths from abortion. Poland, Malta, the Republic of Ireland before it legalized abortion, South Korea, all of these countries have virtually no deaths from backstreet abortions because they have the emergency care in place. Whereas in countries that have worse health care and legal abortion, women still die from backstreet abortions because they want the privacy of a backstreet abortion, they can't access uh, legal abortion and so on. And so what you see is that the reality is Women dying from backstreet abortion is a result of the quality of the healthcare system in a country and has virtually nothing to do with the legal situation in place. Now, there are statistics specifically for Jamaica. I went through, through them in a previous uh, webinar series. Um, it shows that the number of women dying from abortion in Jamaica is extremely small. Now, those women, it's literally just a handful a year, I think, if I remember correctly. Now, those women matter and the, the, their deaths matter and are tragic. And we should be aiming for a world where no woman dies from abortion. But that can't just be done just by legalizing abortion. In the UK, a handful of women die from abortion every year. Um, and, and that's, we know that women have died from abortion in this past year in the UK. So legalizing abortion isn't a simple solution. Um, the real response is to give good emergency care and protect every woman and every baby during pregnancy.
Thanks so much, Dr. Miller. And when we use the phrase backstreet or when the pro-abortion activists use the phrase backstreet, what do they mean? An actual alley or they're talking about an, a doctor who is not in the formal health system or how, how, what is the meaning of backstreet abortion? Yeah, thank you for, for asking me to clarify. There are lots of terms for this. So backstreet abortion, meaning it's done in a back alley. Um, clandestine or clandestine abortion, unsafe abortion. These are generally all meaning the same thing, which is abortion in unsanitary conditions or without the right information. Um, and the argument is that women having a backstreet abortion will, well, more women will have backstreet abortions if abortion is illegal. Um, that's actually not the case necessarily. There are lots of studies showing that in many countries which legalize abortion, backstreet abortions stay the same or sometimes even increase after legalization. So legalizing abortion doesn't get rid of backstreet abortions, but it does cause more legal abortions. And there are medical complications even when a trained doctor carries out an abortion and it is, and it is legalized under the laws of that country. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Just just this past year, just a few months ago, a woman died from a perfectly legal, safe abortion in the UK, which has very, very good quality health care and one of the lowest maternal mortality rates in the world. Hmm. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Miller, Mrs. Christian, Ms. Tavares, for those responses to some of the common arguments and questions that are raised in the debate, I'm going to take one last question, and this was posted in the chat. Is there any possible common ground between the pro-life and the pro-abortion camps? Any possible common ground at all? If, in other words, if abortion must be, what limitations should be placed on the legality of the procedure? I'll ask each of our panelists to comment on that, and then we'll move on to our breakout rooms. Any possible common ground? Mrs. Christian? I, that, that's a, that's a difficult question. <laughs> it really is because I, I don't know that um, a, a pro-choice, um, someone who is, you know, seriously pro-choice, um, I, I don't know if, if they consider, I, I know we've, we've heard, okay, so we will not, in Jamaica, we will not perform abortions after, um, you know, whatever that period is, six weeks or, or eight weeks, whatever that is. Um, but what happens if it is eight weeks um, or it's nine weeks, you know? Um, so it, it's, it's legal if it's eight um, or, or rather it's legal if it's, if it's nine, okay? But if it is nine weeks um, and, and a day, or it is 10 weeks, it's, it's now illegal. Where do, where do you draw the line, you know? I, I don't know if there really is any, any common ground. Right. Perhaps right. Mr. Barris can, <laughs> can think of something, but that's, that, that's, right. it's, it's a difficult question. I think mm -hmm. we're pro-life and, and we are serious about life. And I guess the, the, the persons who are pro-choice are focusing on the rights of a woman mm -hmm. and, we don't believe that it is a woman's right to take a life, so. Well said, thank you, Mrs. Christian. Ms. Tavares? Yes, I think the question is really asking, is there any time where abortion, when abortion should be considered okay? And the answer would be no. Abortion is never okay, and it's never right. Um, we've looked at all of the, 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 the major um, justifications for abortion. Abortion in cases of the, risk to the health of the mother. Dr. Miller explained that an abortion is never justified, which is, and he defined abortion as the intentional killing of the preborn child. That there may be rare instances where the mother's life is at jeopardy and you may need to deliver the baby early, but you don't deliberately kill the child. Yeah? Um, the instance of rape and incest, the, the, the studies show as Miss Christian alluded to, and um, as the host posted in the chat, that the effects of, of abortion um, double the trauma 
for 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 a victim of rape and incest it's not compassionate it it makes things worse so no it's not and and it's a life that's worthy of protection you don't punish an innocent child for the crimes of its father and so no it's not justified in rape and in cases of possible suffering disability poverty or abuse we said no um, you don't predetermine a child's happiness and say that's why you don't deserve to live because you won't be happy so no life is not reserved for the privileged the perfect and the planned it's a it's a general right and all persons deserve it because you're a human being so no abortion is never justified thanks so much mr Vars and dr miller yeah, I, I would agree with the panelists, sorry, the other panelists um, in saying that there's no common ground if the question is, can we meet in the middle and say some abortions are OK and other abortions are not? Um, we can say that delivering the child, if the woman's life is at risk, is OK um, without directly intending to end the life of the child, but foreseeing it. I think we can all agree that that is OK, but directly intending the life of the child can never be OK. And the reason for this isn't because we are extreme or non-compromising it's because human rights and the right to life is a serious right that doesn't allow compromise in international law it says every human being has the right to life and this right shall be protected by law and so what that means is that even if it sounds extreme in some ways we have to take it seriously because that's what human equality means it means that every single human being has the right to life not just some. But on the other hand, what I would say is that there can be a common ground in this way. Um, many people on both sides and in the middle want to agree that women are important. And often this debate is seen as a battle of rights or a battle of well-being between the mother and the child. And so pro-choicers prioritize the mother and we as pro-lifers prioritize the child. And I would say that's not the right way to think about it. Um, when one of us is harmed, all of us are harmed. And the way the mother-child relationship works and father-child relationship works is that when a child is hurt, their parents are hurt as well. That's one of the most fundamental features of being a parent. And so what that means is that when abortion harms an unborn child, it also harms the mother. And as pro-lifers, we don't say the child is more important than the mother. We never say the child is more important than the mother. We say every human being is absolutely equal. And that means that we have to consider the mother and the child equal and look after and support and care for and love them both. And we can do this because the church has been doing it for many centuries. They had, the, the church has always said that widows and orphans should be the, the people who especially receive the care of the society and particularly of the church. And in the modern day, widows and orphans are the people most likely to be involved in abortion. Orphans because the father has left them and sometimes because the mother has, has ended the life of the child as well. And often these are widows in practice because the father has decided to abandon them and not taken responsibility for that child. And so we have a responsibility to say that both lives matter infinitely and to look after both. And so when we say we are against abortion, our response is not just to protect the unborn child legally, but also to look at what we can do to support the mother. And thankfully we have amazing people um, like Stephanie who, who has been doing this in her own work, who have been looking after the mothers and helping them see that abortion won't help them, but actually the best thing for both people in the situation is life. That has better mental health outcomes for the mother. It restores life to the child and it preserves that incredible bond of a mother and a child. And so allows them to, to um, continue that bond. And ultimately, that's what we should be looking for is, is a justice that is relationship centered and that preserves the right of everyone and respects and loves everyone. So when pro-choicers say they care for women, they don't have a monopoly on that. We care for women and we can offer women something better than abortion. 
Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Miller. Love them Thank both. You. And participants, I'm sure you would agree that this evening is a, such a powerful application of apologetics, just taking that biblical worldview and applying it to real life situations that demand justice, that demand compassion, but absolutely demand the truth. So I thank the, the panelists, Dr. Miller, Mrs. Christian, Ms. Tavares, for their factual and truthful and reasoned compassionate responses to these common arguments and questions that are raised in the abortion debate. Now participants, I am inviting you if you are not already uh, to join the movement in defending the right of, to life of the unborn in your circles, but even possibly taking it further afield. And now to invite you to learn some more about how we can apply these facts and these truths in the areas of social media or building out right to life school clubs and equipping the church. And so we're going to have breakout rooms with presenters from overseas who are seasoned advocates in this movement. And they're going to share with us their experiences and their best, best practices. And we're going to have a discussion in the breakout rooms about how we could adapt some of those practices and replicate a campaign in Jamaica. We're going to begin the discussion and the brainstorming, and I hope you would want to continue even after this evening. We're going to stay in touch after this evening and continue until we meet again next January. So I want you to already book your agenda for Saturday, January 22, 2022. That's when we're going to meet again to continue this training. That date is very significant. I won't say why. You can Google it and do the research, but book January 22, 2022, and you will hear more from us closer to the date when we will continue this training. But here are the breakout rooms and the presenters. Dealing with social media, we have Peter Grenham, who is a third year philosophy, politics, and international relations student at the University College Dublin. We're so grateful that he's staying awake for us. And he also works with the pro-life campaign Ireland with their social media channels. Then in the education breakout room, we have Bethany Joy, who is an international pro-life youth mobilizer. At age 18, she led the Students for Life group at her college in Oregon in the USA. After graduation, she worked for Students for Life of America. She helped to found Pro-Life Europe, which now serves student groups in over 10 European countries. And now she's working with Pro-Life Global to internationally equip students to save lives. She is the person for us this evening. And then in the church mobilization breakout room, we have Deborah Stacy, who is a pro-life activist, educator, and apologist, and who has changed thousands of minds on abortion. And her great passion is in equipping the church to be actively pro-life. And we will have Jamaican facilitators in each of this breakout room. We'll hear the best practices and begin a discussion about how we can replicate this in Jamaica and in other Caribbean nations, because I believe we have friends from across the region on this call this evening. But this is a call to action, participants. It's not just taking the information and being persuaded yourself, but it's now being equipped to share it with others and to persuade others on this fundamental truth. 